So one thing before I get started this morning is I want to just I want to emphasize to you that this is a foundational this this message today is foundational for this entire year and that uh, I'm going to really advocate that uh, if if you know someone um, that um, isn't here that maybe normally is here or someone that could use a message of kind of the or the basis of our sin that this would be a good message to turn them to. And so as uh, he said on the video, you really don't understand all of what's going on in the story of our world unless you really understand Genesis 1 through 11, the first 11 chapters. Now, I'm only going to really focus on the first few chapters because we're only a couple days into our reading. But this is really the foundation with which um, everything else is built. So, uh, this week the title is, Who's in Charge? Or the fall of man, who's in charge? I made the mistake of asking Jim how he managed to place five arrows in a silver dollar-sized bullseye at a distance of 30 yards. For the next two hours, Jim, an avid archer, explained the intricacies and complexities of archery I never knew existed. He made a big deal about the law of trajectory. If your aim is off, even a fraction of an inch at your projectile launch point, that is when your arrow is launched, the margin for error rapidly increases based on the distance to the target. The point of impact on the target can only be adjusted by being more precise where you launch. As Jim explained, his craft, my mind raced to a larger truth that he was unknowingly illustrating. We must aim and release the message of the revealed word of God with such precision if we are to reach the intended target where we should. So, what is the crucial aim and release point of the gospel? It's the nature of sin. If we are off target on the question of what sin is, we will be off target about what, the, what salvation is. Now, I recall I went to a doctor, one I used to go to uh, years ago, and he was a careful, methodical man. So even when I had my mind made up as to what was wrong, he would invariably put me through a series of procedures. There was the examination, blood tests, x-rays, or maybe an ultrasound. Uh, we'd, I'd have to give stool samples or urine and so forth. Now during one visit, I happened to, to ask him why he did so many tests. And he said the most difficult and complicated part of what I do is diagnosing the problem. If I am impulsive or hasty in assessing what is wrong with my patient, the prognosis or the treatment will be useless or might even be dangerous. The church and the medical clinic have a lot of similarities. Accurate diagnosis is the foundation of the healing of the soul as well as the body. And that's why I have such implicit trust in the Bible. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. That the accurate diagnosis of sin is that it is a kingdom or leadership issue. Now, as I stated... Because our aim and release point, that is the nature of sin, it is so vital to hitting the bullseye. We must carefully examine the text, and specifically today in Genesis, about creation and the fall. So you've read through hopefully the first few chapters. I'm sure you've read them before. They're a fairly familiar story, uh, but let's dig in. First point this morning is that the world under God's leadership is good. It is free from sin. So let's look at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God proceeded to create light, the atmosphere, 
land, water, and animals. At the end of each day, we read that God calls it good. Then God creates man, the pinnacle of his creation. And this time, we read that God calls it very good. Now, I'm not an artist, but back in Michigan, I have a friend whose wife is. I remember spending some time over at their house years ago and sitting there watching her paint and paint for hours. And uh, I looked at it, and it was very good. But as she talked to me, she said, you know, here's a couple of flaws that I see here. And she graded her work as average. While I disagree with her, the reality was she is the creator of the art. She understands what it takes to make very good art much better than I ever will. God is the ultimate creative artist. Notice again that at the end of each day he calls it good and when man is created, very good. There is no one else around. So very clearly the standard of very good is not my standard of very good. It's not your standard of very good. It is God's standard of very good. He's expressing this from the perspective of a perfect and all-powerful God. The creation of man was God's culmination of the masterpiece, and it was very good. In Genesis chapter 1, the Hebrew word that's used for the name of God is Elohim. It reveals to us that God is infinite, he's all-powerful, and he shows his work as a creator, sustainer, and supreme judge of the world. He is the king. He is over all and in all. However, in Genesis 2, the Hebrew word used is Yahweh. Yahweh reveals that not only is God king, but he is also a personal God. He longs for a fruitful relationship with his creation. This is revealed in Genesis chapter 2 in multiple ways. God gave Adam the responsibility and authority to name each of the living creatures. He also gave Adam a suitable helper in the form of Eve, so that Adam would not be alone. He told him that he may eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, adding, when you do, you will certainly die. At the end of Genesis 2, we read that Adam and Eve were naked and felt no shame. They are living happily under the loving rule of their all-powerful yet personal God. No pun intended, but it would seem that Adam and Eve were a match made in heaven. Secondly, and this is really the crucial part of this message, the world under man's leadership is full of sin, is evil, full of sin. One Friday night, after getting dressed up and applying a healthy amount of makeup, Leah, a high school sophomore, was ecstatic about going to a party with her senior boyfriend, Tony. As she walked out, her dad reminded her to be safe and that she had his phone number if she needed him to come pick her up, rather than letting Tony drive, drink and drive. As she walked out, Leah rolled her eyes to herself. I can handle this. They treat me like I'm a little kid. She hopped into Tony's car and rode off to the party. A few hours later, after saying goodbye to a few friends, she found Tony to take her home. He'd spent his time at the party drinking and in no shape to be driving. But having had a bit too much to drink herself, her mind was a bit fuzzy. Did her dad really say, Leah, I'd much rather pick you up 
than have you ride with Tony if he'd been drinking? She couldn't recall with any firm clarity. She quickly pushed the thought to the back of her mind. She replaced it with the thought from earlier. I can handle this without help. Tony would be able to get her home. After all, it was less than two miles to their house. They hop in the car and recount the time that they had at the party, feeling good. About a mile and a half later, Tony swerved into traffic. Bam! Life as they knew it came to a screeching halt. Now, at the start of Genesis chapter 3, we find ourselves observing the, sat the, the serpent, Satan, laying his trap. He says, notice, did God really say? So what is Satan up to in these words? He's planting a seed of doubt about what God said. In other words, I'm paraphrasing here, Eve, maybe you thought you heard God say that, but what if you misheard him? And if you can't really trust your memory here, can you really, can you really be sure that there's anything wrong with just a small bite? Now, Eve was able to avoid this trap. She answers him, with the words, um, again, paraphrasing that God, what God told them to do, to not eat from that tree. Yet Satan doesn't stop there. He follows up by saying, you will not die. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like, here you go, here's the thing, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent here now is planting doubt about who God is. First it was what did he say, now it's who he is. Satan's twofold lie that Adam and Eve bought into this was, again, paraphrasing, God is not to be trusted. He's holding back on you. If you want to know what it's truly like to live, to be like God, then it's time to remove yourself from this, his restraints and run your own life. You determine what's right and wrong. You determine what's good and evil. Not him. Now, if there's a mindset that typifies what is wrong with man more than this? I've yet to find it. We long to run our own lives. The nature of man's sin is at this kingdom level. Adam and Eve made the decision right then and there that controlling their own lives, the thought of being like God was more appealing than living under the authority of a loving God. Isn't it interesting how Satan's traps can mess you up when you listen to him and cause us to trust in our own ability? That we can control ourselves better than anything else? I think about the story that I shared with about Leah. How quick are we to turn to I know what I can do. I know what I can handle. I don't need help. And then sin drags you in, and you know what? When in that moment where we should be drawn out of it and say, God, we need you, we very often have bought into the lie that there's something better for us, and so we just dig in deeper. You see, one moment... Adam and Eve understood that the ultimate fulfillment in life was living under a God they knew who loved them completely. And then the next moment, God now seemed oppressive and controlling. 
This is what a, a lie from the devil can do to us. In that instant, they traded the leadership of a perfect king. And they decided that their own wisdom was better. By the way, I'm glad I got that recently because I heard that the Burger King just closed down. So, But, but isn't this what we do? We trade God's good for a, a piece of junk. And we say, well, well, it's my piece of junk. And I'm in charge of it. And I can do whatever I want. We've all been there. What a miserable wreck Adam and Eve made of this world that God originally called very good. But that's not even the worst part. Finally, every aspect of our world has been tainted by the presence of sin. Now, one of my favorite things to do is also one of my least favorite, if that's possible. So, growing up in West Michigan, near a lot of beaches, I loved to go to the beach. I loved to swim. I loved to get out. I loved the lakes here. But as an adult, I've learned also to hate it with kids. I learned to hate it because as we're driving to the beach, all my mind can seem to think to is all of the grains of sand that will end up in my vehicle. And I think this is such, as I was thinking about this this week, this is such a great analogy for this, that even just a little bit of sand can cause all sorts of havoc in your vehicle. It manages to find its way into all of the crevices. It can cause issue with the paint and even functionality of the vehicle. It seems like a small thing, like no big deal, but its presence affects everything that it touches. Now, before you try to take yourself off the hook and blame Adam and Eve, we've all been there. We all let the lies of this world entice us so that we believe at times that man's method is right. Let's just call it what it is. That we, underneath some of the surface, underneath some of the polish with which we may shine ourselves up with, there is a hunger in the flesh to follow ourselves, to trust ourselves. The loving way that God offers seems wrong and oppressive. Now I know, even though I don't, you know, I don't know people's secrets, but I know that we all have those rough edges, those rough spots, those, those times in our life in particular that are, we probably can all look back and say that was a, that was a season of where sin where sin was stronger maybe than it was in other points in time. These are often those moments that we say, man, I don't want people to know that about me. What would they think about me then? What a miserable wreck we have made of this world that was originally very good. Now, even now, I recognize, after all I've said, there still may be someone in this room that's convinced they're a good person. We are all well-versed in being able to maximize the sin in those around us while, in turn, minimizing it in our own lives. I think about a personal example of just uh, what really strikes me in the stage of life that I am in is when I... Uh, when I say something to my kids, and he said, you know, you don't do that. That's not, you know, that's not something that God would want us to do. And then in the very next breath, what happens? Not always, but more than it should. I do the exact same thing. Is it sin? You bet it's sin. 
And yet we have this innate ability, all of us, to say, well, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I had, I had a right reason for what I did. I have justification. It's because of what they did to me. But nobody else gets that kind of um, freedom, if you will. It's what we call self-justification. We do this so well at times, we don't even realize it. When we buy into the lie that we know what is good for our lives, and we follow our own heart rather than God's, we often expose ourselves to a lot of trouble. Now, anyone who has attempted to parent a child knows from experience the extraordinary capacity for inventive self-justification that resists in each of us. Children are born masters at manipulating data to explain why their behavior is okay. Trust me, I live with it every day. They instinctively know how to plead sickness or ignorance, victimization, weakness, inability, misunderstanding, or some combination of these classic excuses. Should it surprise you that we as adults have systematically turned these into definitions of behavior? Why? So that we can alleviate our conscience from any sense of guilt. Without outside help, we tend to massage the truth about our behavior until we get the explanation we can comfortably live with. What excuses do you find yourself using when you, when you fall short, when you sin? Do you blame others? Is it the responsibility of others? Do you show the grace with those around you that you do to yourself? The fall of sin in our world is that every aspect has been tainted with sin. Now here's a few passages of things, some of which you probably came across, or if not, you will come across as you read through these. Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to just hit the, the highlights here. That every inclination of their thoughts was only evil all the time. This was right before the flood. Genesis chapter 8. For the intent of man's heart from, is evil from his youth. Jeremiah 7 verse 24. They follow the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. Jeremiah 17. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Romans 3. None is righteous, not one. And then Romans 8. I'm going to read this whole one here. Even the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the, one, by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So what's that saying? Not only were we affected, not only was mankind affected by sin, all of creation bears the marks of a fallen world. Yet because we love our freedom, our control so much, it's hard to fully grasp the sin and how deeply entrenched it is in our lives. Like sand, the first attempt to get rid of it doesn't complete the job. In fact, some of it is so ground in, we can't even see it ourselves. Because of our bent towards self-justification, some sin can only be rooted out by prayer, 
or through an entrusted person who aids us to help us be accountable. And even now as I prepare to close, I recognize that the desire to hold on to what has been a source of comfort is not so easily tilled up. We balk at the thought of needing to change. We deflect that by blaming other people and other things for the sinful choices that we make. I think of Judas's words after Jesus tells him that he would betray him. Even as Judas, catch this, Judas has already moved forward in his plans. He already knows what he's going to do. And yet he has the gall to say to Jesus, Surely not I, Lord. It is clear that in our longing to seek control and to justify our actions, we willingly trade the very good for inclined for evil. Each of us is called to share the gospel with those whom we come into contact with. But the gospel doesn't start at the cross. I think we make the mistake too often of starting with the cross. It starts at the beginning with who God is, free from sin, and secondly, who we are apart from God, sinners. We leave that part out, I think unintentionally maybe, but what are we saved from? Why are we saved? Why did Jesus have to come? When we submit to God and live under his loving authority. Have you ever been in that? I mean, maybe it's maybe you found this with a spouse. You know, it's not perfect, obviously, but maybe you found or with with a parent where you willingly live under their submission. You say, "You know what? I know imperfectly, but I know that you love me and you want what's best for me. Have you been in that type of relationship before? It's a small glimpse of Eden. It's a small glimpse of what heaven can be. What heaven on earth can look like. And when you've experienced it, and you see what else is out there, you are reminded what a glorious reality it is. And so if our aim and release point on the nature of sin is anything other than God's rightful and loving leadership, we will miss life, the life full of mission and purpose that God has given us. If someone is king in your life, if he is Lord over all that you are, what rights do you have? Are you willing to give up those rights that you believe you have to submit to a loving king? Do you trust that what he wants for you is what's best? Or do you know better? Because if you do, you're going to continue to, lo to live into this mindset that you are justified in all that you do. And that you will carefully construct your life, you'll control it in such a way that you'll believe that what you're doing is what's best. And so we are reminded today that the accurate diagnosis for the nature of sin is that it's an issue of leadership. Who is it that's leading your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we are so thankful for uh, who you are. Lord, that, that you, a God so big as the, the creator of the universe, supreme over all, uh, perfect uh, in, in, in in and of yourself, Lord, that you had no um, specific need for us to be here, Lord, but yet you um, desire this relationship. You desire um, an act of, of obedience, 
from us, Lord, that we love you, that you've chosen to use us as your vessels here for your purpose. Lord, I think about the question that's most maybe touched my life over the last decade or so, and that's who do I follow? Lord, I recognize that who or what I'm following dictates where my life is heading. And Lord, I pray that in everything that I do and that I say, um, how I interact with people, uh, the thoughts that run through my mind, Lord, I pray that they are glorifying you, that they are pointing me in your direction. And Lord, sometimes, you know, sin takes place. Sometimes our, our launch point is, is, uh, is, is, is off point, and we end, off, we end up flying off the map with our, with our target, or with our arrow, Lord. And I just pray that you will realign us, help us to be um, entrusting, that you uh, show us the, the, proper look, the proper place to start, Lord, and that proper place is under your authority. So, Lord, as we go this week, um, I think the challenge for us all is what are you calling us to do? Who are you calling us to be? And in whom's life, in whom life of those that we come across are we to be, to be examples of you? Lord, we know that you are over it all and that you have already prepared in advance people for us to come across. Help us to be ready. Help us to be prepared. Help us to be studied up. Help us diligently this year. Lord, I pray for everyone here um, and, and at home, uh, Lord, that as they set forth in this journey of, of digging in again to your word, that they will be uh, continually changed. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction and the song. To the king of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. And as you go from this place, something you're going to hear from me just about every Sunday is, you are sent. Remember that you are sent from this place, and now your ministry begins. Go in peace.